score low on typical academic intelligence tests, and yet day to day in life just seem like friggin' geniuses. I'll give you an example. I had a, a father of a friend of mine who was a metal worker, and this guy could come into a room. He had to make uh, what they call plenums or or airways, you know, between rooms for a furnace, and he could those get to be complex boxes when they have to go around angles and things of that nature. And what it pointed out was that this guy could go in and he could measure something without writing anything down, go to a piece of metal, zip, 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 mark it all out, snip it all out, fold it together with the correct folds and edges and everything and pop it into place and write almost every time. Now, I don't know if this guy scored high on IQ tests or not, but I know this guy was a genius at spatial relations. So when we look at what we're measuring, we always have to find out, is the test valid? In other words, are IQ tests really measuring what we think they're measuring? Are they really measuring someone's intelligence? And that's called validity or, or being valid. So one issue that we deal with in testing is, is something valid. Now, in the past, we've had various IQ tests, and we'll talk about those in a little bit. A second issue is something reliable. In other words, once you measure it, and you measure it again the second time, you get pretty much the same measurement. Now, my measurements are not reliable when I do my carpentry work. I'm astounded how often I'm off, but that's just my own lack of ability there, or lack of paying attention to detail. So, does it measure what it's supposed to measure? Is it reliable? Let me give you an example. They used to think that the size of one's skull determined one's intelligence. So when people die, they take their skulls off, they cut a hole in them, clean them all out, and they'd fill them with BBs. And the more BBs they got in there, the brighter the person was judged to be. And that's a fairly reliable measure, although they actually screwed with that a little bit by shaking it sometimes. But that's a fairly reliable measure. In other words, you keep getting about the same measurement each time. But was it a valid measure of IQ? Not at all. Turns out that there's very little relationship between size of, of within a species of one's head. And you have some people who are extraordinarily bright who have small skulls, you have some people who are extraordinarily slow who have very large skulls and everything, every other combination you can imagine. So it was a reliable measure, they got about the same number of BBs each time, but it wasn't a valid measure. Now if we look at what we're measuring, there's a guy that I really like, there's lots of different stuff covered in your textbook or on your CD-ROM that you might be looking at, but uh, there's one guy that I really like that we'll talk about a couple of different times in this course, and his name is Sternberg. And Sternberg has looked at IQ tests in general, and he certainly agrees with Spearman that the G factor, the verbal and math intelligence, is highly important and a very important thing. And he says he sees three types of intelligence. One is analytic, and sometimes that's referred to as academic. Analytic intelligence or academic intelligence, and this is what our IQ tests are currently measuring pretty much. The second thing that he sees is practical intelligence. My dad was a maintenance man at a, a, a college in Kansas City, Missouri, and my dad was a very bright guy. He only had a high school diploma, but he read all his life. He really thought through things. We discussed politics at the dinner table and all that good stuff. And he'd be called in the middle of the night by these world-renowned college professors who couldn't figure out how to light <laughs> their water heater. And I could just see my dad going, <laughs> getting frustrated. How could they be so damn academically bright and not be able to figure out a water heater? So he argued that there'd be practical intelligence. And the third thing that we not only don't measure on, on IQ tests, but I'm personally convinced actually we get punished for an IQ test and we get lower scores, is people who are highly creative. And yet, of course, highly creative coming up with new solutions, new ideas, has got to be a type of intelligence. So Sternberg argues that we have three things that should be measured. And any studies so far, He's finding that these three things are relatively independent. In other words, they have low correlations between the three. And somebody who's really bright, of course, would score high on all three, not just on the academic, but also on the practical and on the creative. So I kind of keep that in mind. Another question is, how much of this is um, genetic? And if we look at this chart up here, we'll focus on this chart for just a minute, we can see a lot of information. And this chart shows one of psychologists' favorite things, and that's to study identical twins who have been raised separately from birth. Now, what's so special about them? Identical twins have one egg, one sperm, and it's split. So they've got the same genes. If they've been raised separately from birth, particularly in radically different environments, they have different environments. So it helps answer this old question, how much do, does biology 
versus or heredity, how much does heredity versus environment contribute to things like our IQ? Well, if we look at this particular chart, this vertical axis goes from zero correlation all the way up to a perfect correlation of 1.0, and then there are various groups. And let's start over here. This one that's at a little over 0.3 correlation of intelligence is the correlation between unrelated individuals who are reared together. In other words, a kid who is a biological child of some parents and his adopted brother or sister. Uh, genetically unrelated, but lives in a similar environment. And uh, they have only about a, a 0.3 something correlation. In other words, the same environment didn't make them have the same intelligence. Siblings, brothers and sisters who share about 50% of their genes reared together have about a 40.46 or something of that nature, close to a 0.5 correlation in their IQs. That's brother and sister, brother and brother, sister and sister reared together. If you have fraternal twins, now they're the same genetic relationship as a brother and brother, for example, but they're born at the same time, so their environment's a little more similar they get about a 0.6 correlation in intelligence. And this means that their IQ scores are about 60% similar. Identical twins reared apart suddenly jump up to about 0.72. So identical twins who aren't even raised together have IQs that are about 72% alike, according to this study. And um, this comes out of, of, of uh, Worth Publishers, by the way, this artwork. And then finally, you look at identical twins reared together who have the same genes and about the same environment, you get an almost 0.90 correlation. So what have we concluded? Well, it's really not nature versus nurture as we've often heard. In other words, it's not biology versus environment. It's really how does environment help us or hinder us from expressing our biological potential. And so far, the estimates range right around 60%, and that will become an important figure that genes make up about 60% of what one's IQ eventually can become given a decent environment. Now let's take a look at that in a, from another perspective. And this artwork comes from Brooke Cole Publishers. And this is simply the normal distribution curve. And you can see that uh, you, you've run into this before. And it's like the bell-shaped curve. And what it does is it has across here IQ scores with 100 being right at the average, and then 115, 130, 145, or from 100 down to 85, 70, and 55. What you see is very few people, and this is numbers of people up here, so very few people have really low IQs, very few people have really high IQs, and most of the rest of us are right here in the middle someplace. So if we looked at plus or minus one standard deviation, from the mean, about 68% of us would fall in that category, right, right around 100. So most of us fit in this part of the curve right here. And that's right in this particular area. If we did plus or minus two standard deviations, my goodness, we're all of a sudden up to 95% of the population. So there are a few people really slow on this end, and a few geniuses way, way, way up here that are so different uh, on that far end. And that's how IQ tends to be distributed. Now, let's look at, at uh, some ideas about, very controversial ideas about race and IQ. And listen carefully to this because it has such practical social implications for our society. Every once in a while you hear people make claims that one group of people is genetically superior to another. Of course, that was the Nazi idea. That was the, uh, the idea that was uh, very strong in America in the early 1900s of trying to get rid of bad genes and what they meant by good genes were northern European genes and get everybody as homogenous as possible. And those ideas really affect social policy. But let's take a look at an article by a guy named Thomas Sowell. And this is a race and IQ. And this is, most of this information is taken from Sowell. And it's called Race and IQ, a Historical Perspective. And it's a very powerful article because what he does is he goes through the history of IQ testing. And IQ testing is still highly respected. It was highly respected around World War I and, and prior to that. But at various times, IQ testing has been used to uh, say one group is inferior to another group, as a group, not individuals. And that creates some problems. And let's take a look at the real evidence. 
For example, in early IQ testing, the Chinese Americans who came here were tested and they scored woefully lower than the Anglo-Americans who were here, the people from Northern Europe. And in fact, expert psychologists at the time said Chinese were incapable of abstract reasoning, that they really would uh, dilute the Nordic stock of America and they shouldn't be allowed in and we should deport all the Chinese. Uh, some outrageous statements. Now, think about that one for a moment. Have you ever been to a university recently at a math department or a physics department <laughs> or a computer programming department? Count the number of Asians there. Count the number of Chinese. Count the number of South Asians from India. Count the number of Japanese. Count the number of Koreans. They have not only succeeded at abstract reasoning, if you look at IQ tests now, uh, the average Asian American scores higher than the average white American. Now, why don't you hear that argument when you're hearing people say one group is superior to another? You rarely hear that argument. Uh, are any of you of Italian descent? Hmm. According to these early psychologists, your parents were significantly less intelligent than the other, or your, your, your uh, ancestors were significantly less intelligent than the Nordic Europeans and shouldn't be allowed in the country. And on top of that, they said you were criminally inclined. If you're insulted by that, I hope so. It was an absurd statement, uh, but it was based upon psychological research. The Greeks, the Jews, the Italians, the Poles, the Lithuanians, all of these people scored significantly below the national average in IQ tests when they got here. And now every one of those groups are at the national average or above the national average. And if you look at various groups, they've succeeded quite dramatically. So I guess my main point on Thomas Sowell's article, S-O-W-N-E-L-L, is that we really need to be very careful about comments that are made and research about race and IQ because we need to learn from the past. Thomas Sowell, by the way, way was a um, um, economist who was a PhD economist, an African American who was in the Reagan uh, administration. So very conservative politically, interestingly enough, and yet he clearly sees the abuses that race and IQ has gone to in the past. So let's take a look, keeping in mind Sowell's article, because it's powerful to keep in mind, uh, an article by Arthur Jensen uh, in 1969, uh, published in a very prestigious journal called the Harvard Educational Review. Now what I want to point out is his findings. Don't stop the tape there because there's significant problems with his findings, including logical errors and things of that nature. And we'll go through that. And the question will be, why would somebody who was so prestigious, uh, I think he taught at the University of California at Berkeley at the time, and why would somebody so prestigious be believed even when there were glaring errors in the research, particularly in light of what we know about Chinese, Greek, Italian, Lithuanian Americans that were said to be inferior and thought of as separate races in the past. Well, let's take a look at his findings first. Number one, he found that there was a black, white, IQ gap. Now, have we seen that before? Remember, IQ is a test, right? It's not what one's real intelligence is. It's a score on a test. And we attempted to make the two close together. And we heard this before. Well, of course we've heard it. We heard about the Chinese, the, the Lithuanians, all the people I just mentioned. He said, number two, IQ is 60 to 80% genetic. He uses some big fancy terms called heritability. What it boils down to is he's saying it's 60 to 80 percent. And he picks, by the way, this figure 80 percent for his article. Number three, um, therefore, difference in IQ between blacks and whites is genetic. And number four, therefore, we shouldn't waste public taxes on things like Head Start, a program that's been proven to help people, low-income whites, low-income Native Americans, low-income African Americans, succeed dramatically in school when they go through these programs. So look at this, black and white IQ, uh, there's a gap, 
the gap happened to be lower than there was between Chinese and whites earlier in the century, by the way, lower than between Jews and other groups, lower between Italians and, and Anglos. Uh, number two, IQ is 68% genetic. Number three, uh, therefore, there's a, the difference in IQ between blacks and whites is genetic. Finally, number four, it has public policy implications. And that's why these debates are so important. So let's look at what's wrong with his, his uh, argument. So this is errors in Jensen's argument. And there are several things wrong with Jensen's argument. Number one, and I suppose you caught this as we went through, you might have asked the question, why did he pick 0.80 for the correlation between genetics and intelligence? When in fact, most studies said somewhere between 0.60 and 0.80, and the studies since have now settled right around about 50% to 60%. So number one, this is a problem with this study. He obviously is picking the higher number because it helps push his point of view. Number two, he studied identical twins. Remember that from, from our previous example? Uh, separated from birth and some living together. They studied both groups in Northern Europe. All right, so number one, that's a very small sample. It's on one particular subgroup of the human species. It's not a sample of a variety of human species, but in fairness to him, the reality is that genetics have been shown to be highly important. But this is a problem. Number three, if we look at race, you know, I'd ask the question, what is Tiger Woods? Race has never been separated distinctly into a pure white race, a pure black race, and all these things like we assume. In fact, one of the current anthropological theories that holds greatest sway at this moment, and the research so far seems to be backing it up, is that the human species originated in East Africa. One group moved off and became the Asians, same species. Another group moved off a little bit later and became the Europeans, same species. So in that respect, we all come from Africa, and the gene flow has been through those three groups all down through history. So this concept of a pure race really doesn't make sense. Biologists have gotten rid of the concept of race as a measure of biology. Race is a combination of some slight genetic differences and a whole bunch of cultural differences, the way we define it. Think of Tiger Woods. He's got some Asian influence genetically. He's got some African influence. He's got some uh, Anglo influence. What would we define him as a race? And it, he's not the only one. There are, there's huge gene flow that's happened over the last several thousand years. So that's a problem. And then number four, keep in mind Soul's, it's one else, Soul's article on race. And writing is getting horrible here. Soul's article on race. You know, if, if we already have an IQ gap of the Chinese and they suddenly have surpassed the nation's average intelligence, wouldn't that make you rather suspicious? But the last one really relates to number two again, and it's a strange statement that I'll take some time to explain here. Within group, and this is the logical error, within group differences, in other words, differences within the white group that might be explained genetically, studying white European twins, uh, do not explain between group differences. Now that won't make a lot of sense to explain it. Number five, within group differences do not explain between group differences. So he's trying to say that the within group differences of the whites that were studied and showed that IQ was 60 to 80 percent the logical error here is that that doesn't mean that if you compare that to between two different groups, for example, a group that might be culturally and biologically labeled as of African descent or of European descent. So let's take a closer look at this number five, this logical error. And I'm going to use an analogy that's rather strange, to say the least, and I hope it will explain it pretty good. If we had a whole bunch of sunflower seeds and we had a, a, just a bucket full of them, and they're randomly all distributed in there, we reach in, and some of these sunflower seeds come from parents that are tall breeding sunflowers. And naturally, given good living conditions, they will grow to be tall plants. Some of them randomly, about a third of them, are medium growing. And notice the parallel here to intelligence scores. And some of them are short growing. Okay? 
Now, if we look at those, we put them all in the same environment. That environment might be this, this uh, box planter. And they've got everything they need to grow in there. Uh, and you've got sunflower A, sunflower B, sunflower C. And you can see the differences within this group. Notice within are 100% what? They've all got the same environment. So the differences between sunflower A, B, and C in height have to be 100% genetic. All right? Now that's where we look at the white European twins. The differences between them were significantly due to genetics and their intelligence. Let's take that same pile of seeds and put them in a different environment. And this time the environment we're putting them in is going to be a perfect environment also. Plenty of sun, plenty of soil, just like the first environment, but it is minus zinc. It's missing zinc, which we didn't even know until about 30 years ago the plants needed to grow. And when we grow these suckers, what we find is that the tall ones, the tall parentage, grow to about the height of the, the medium parents previously. The ones of the medium parents previously grow to about the small size, and the small ones grow to even a smaller size. All right, so now we've got an interesting situation. We have two environments, one that's perfect, it's got all the sun, zinc, everything you need, one that's perfect except it doesn't have zinc. The difference between C, uh, D, E, and F, sunflower and height, they're all in the same environment, so it can't be environmental. The difference between them is 100% genetic. Okay, now keep in mind the analogy we're making here. Jensen argued that differences between groups were the result of differences, the same explanation as a result of differences within groups. He said that if whites are shown to be 60 to 80 percent, uh, their IQ is 60 to 80 percent due to genetics, then that means the difference between white IQ scores and black IQ scores is the result of genetics. Well, now we've just shown that this group is 100 percent different in height due to genetics. This group within the group is 100 percent due to genetics due to height. But the differences between group one and group two are due to what? Lousy environment over here. So we put this together. The differences between are 100% environment. OK, now let's go back. So. If we didn't talk about heights of flowers, but rather scores on IQ tests, what you'd find is that you have people from different environments, some groups that have emphasized education more than others. African Americans in the United States, for example, there were 14 states that literally passed laws that said you cannot get an education. You will be punished if you learn to read and write. White people who help you learn to read and write will be punished. So that's a very different atmosphere. So. Uh, Jensen's article had some glaring errors, and this is glaring error number five that's problematic. And you have to stop and question, why would academics, why would all these bright people, why would people in journalism jump on this article and believe it whole hog? And it's often been stated this is the most quoted and least read article in academic circles. And there are some clear logical errors there. Now, in light of Thomas Sowell's article on the Chinese, the Lithuanians, the Greeks, the Italians having an IQ gap, and then over time as they assimilated into dominant middle class society, their IQ scores magically rose. You think they got smarter? Maybe they were just better assimilated. So I think we need to keep that in mind. Thank you very much. They're all in the same environment, so it can't be environmental. The difference between them is 100% genetic. You know, keep in mind the analogy we're making here. Jensen argued that differences between groups were the result of differences, the same explanation as a result of differences within groups. He said that if whites are shown to be 60 to 80 percent, uh, their IQ is 60 to 80 percent due to genetics, then that means the difference between white IQ scores and black IQ scores is the result of genetics. Well, now we've just shown that this group is 100 percent different in height due to genetics. This group within the group is 100 percent due to genetics due to height. But the differences between group one and group two are due to what? Lousy environment over here. So we put this together. The differences between are 
environment. Okay, now let's go back. So if we didn't talk about heights of flowers, but rather scores on IQ tests, what you'd find is that you have people from different environments, some groups that have emphasized education more than others. African Americans in the United States, for example, there were 14 states that literally passed laws that said you cannot get an education. You will be punished if you learn to read and write. White people who help you learn to read and write will be punished. So that's a very different atmosphere. So uh, Jensen's article had some glaring errors, and this is glaring error number five that's problematic. And you have to stop and question, why would academics, why would all these bright people, why would people in journalism jump on this article and believe it whole hog? And it's often been stated this is the most quoted and least read article in academic circles. And there are some clear logical errors there. Now, in light of Thomas Sowell's article on the Chinese, the Lithuanians, the Greeks, the Italians having an IQ gap, and then over time as they assimilated into dominant middle class society, their IQ scores magically rose. You think they got smarter? Maybe they're just better assimilated. So I think we need to keep that in mind. Thank you very much.